<laughs> so I'm Sarah Lipton. I'm the director here at the Senior Activity Center. We're delighted to have you all, as well as all of you. This is wonderful. I just wanted to give a little plug to a couple of things going on here in addition to these wonderful lectures happening. Um, we, you might know that we are in the midst of March, and this is March for Meals Month, which is the month in which we are celebrating the incredible resource that we have here through the Senior Activity Center, which is called Feast Senior Meals, which are Meals on Meals program and our curbside meals that go out to all older adults that have need for food, and we have locally sourced delicious food we offer. I wanted to mention that we've created a really beautiful sort of feature film kind of thing, and if you're interested in supporting our program, it's just a $25 donation, and we will get the online link if you can watch it at any time. We're sort of premiering it on Friday, but after that, you can watch it whenever you want, and I think it's really good, so you should, you know, sign up for it. We also have our spring classes getting started in just a couple of weeks, and there's still time to register. There's over 30 different programs and classes being offered, wellness classes, arts classes, culture classes, movement classes, all kinds of amazing things, so check that out. And just finally, in case anybody happens to know a communications and development expert, we are in need of somebody. <laughs> so if you happen to know of anyone, send them my way. <laughs> Thank you so much, enjoy the afternoon. So glad you're here. I, it almost didn't happen, so it wasn't in front porch forum in Montpelier, so yay for you coming. Um, the reason it almost didn't happen is Tom Sabo, who is the uh, teacher advisor for this group. Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can take it. No, no, I'm just making fun of myself. Um, he's a teacher advisor and the sustainability coordinator for the Montpelier. Is this good? Yes. Montpelier uh, Roxbury School area and winner of many education awards. Um, he tested positive for COVID. This is the new normal, right? Uh, so it's almost metaphorical that he couldn't come but the young people came. So but before we start, um, just want to remind, remind you next week is Reed Lindbergh coming to talk about memoirs, writing her own and her memoirs of others. Um, the refugee program is up on Orca, and the other ones will follow. Um, is it, is it, was there anything else I'm supposed to remember? No. So I'm really excited to have two generations here to talk about this important topic. Um, these, this is Gabe, Ben, Noah, Willow, and Mira. Um, and they're members of the Earth Group at Montpelier High School. They're also members of the Vermont Youth Lobby who have been having summits for how long? Long time? Sorry. How long has the Vermont Youth Lobby been? Uh, way longer than I've been. Around. Way long. And they meet annually to share ideas, use, and set action plans. Um, they're also part of the Youth Climate Work Congress. Um, and they meet regularly with our legislators and tell them what's important. So, so today, I, so I'm reassured to see them. I'm very eager to hear their perspective on how our generation's decisions have affected them in their future. Um, so, I, I also should tell you that I kind of set them up to say that we would be interested in hearing what we could do to support them. So if you're not interested, you can close your ears right now. <laughs> All right. So without further ado, are you starting? Yeah. Thank you. So move on to the next slide. Oh, yeah. just, no. It's a dim light. Okay. Oh, 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 this, you want one of us? You got one. Okay. So um, yeah, I think uh, we would start off with kind of just a brief overview of how we got here from our perspective. Um, just some points of uh, data shows that our current change in climate is due to an increase in atmospheric greenhouse gases, notably CO2. Uh, we know this because other 
uh, other factors that would affect the warming of the planet are not changing as much as the amount of CO2, which we know we are pumping into our atmosphere at a rate that we can't reabsorb. It takes millions of years for CO2 to come into, to go into the ground, become fossil fuels, and we're mining it in large quantities and burning it up within seconds back into our atmosphere. We've been doing it for the past few hundred years since the Industrial Revolution, and here are just some like data points, but that's basically how we got to this uh, place that we are now. Dave, if you want to take your mask off while you're talking, it might be easier to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys heard. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, so this is how we got to this crisis. And I think Noah can kind of go over what the crisis looks like right now and what this kind of change in the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere means for our planet. Uh, yeah, so stand over here. Um, so basically, what the problem is uh, currently um, and in our current situation uh, is that global warming has led to uh, climate change, as most of you may know. Um, climate change is causing a lot of uh, you know adverse events that really affect a lot of the part, a lot of parts of the world, um, like um, extreme and intermittent weather events, uh, increased flooding and increased droughts, uh, disruption in food production, rising sea levels are contaminating fresh water supplies, flooding coastal cities, um, partly due, in part, and actually mostly due to the melting of sea ice and glaciers um, in our poles, and then also the loss of biodiversity um, on land and in the sea. Uh, so every year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, produces a report, uh, and that report contains uh, numbers uh, in actually degrees that uh, relate to indicate that if warming, exceed, warming exceeds that certain degree point, we will hit a, a climactic tipping point. Um, and each year, that number is lowering because they're finding out new uh, data and information, and we're already at one Celsius uh, above, uh, and so basically, as you can see, 1.5 Celsius is the tipping point, so we're around like 0.5 Celsius away um, from that, and this is expected to occur in the early 2030s. And did you, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so can I just expanding on that? Um, kind of a grim view of what is currently happening and where we're at right now um, and the kind of time sensitive nature of this crisis seeing as in the early 2030s if we maintain course and the climate warms by another 0.5 degrees Celsius everyone here will still be in our late 20s which is pretty young and we'll be there to see this tipping point in climate where we can't go back and where it's irreparably damaged. And that's pretty scary to think about. And so some kind of things, um, when addressing the problem, it's not only the physical problem going on with climate change that we're seeing in the world, uh, but also the problem of not doing anything about that problem, I guess, is a separate thing that we're still trying to battle. Um, do you have a question? No, okay, sorry. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, th this is called the science action gap, where science has overwhelmingly said that this is the, the temperature is consistently warming. This is what happens when the temperature gets above this degrees. This is a problem that we can scientifically prove. Yet, in getting in our way is, is the way that we've set up our economy, where we've set up our, where kind of constant growth is something that we measure success by, which is not necessarily good when we're talking about the amount of oil we've already drilled and the amount of oil we've taken is more than we can afford to burn into our atmosphere. So even though it's not economically sound for us to, to divest in oil and it's not economically sound to not continue to burn that oil that we've already taken out, it is going to be even more disastrous to our, to our world. So I think it's just something to think about and the psychology around what the reality of it is versus what the risk people assume. 
uh, it is. And it's hard to kind of face how broad and awful this, these conditions are, but it's something that we have to do, and we have to get past this kind of like psychological boundary around uh, the way that we view the earth and the way that we view um, the, the way we can function as a society. Because if we continue to function like this, the climate is not going to be able to survive much longer. So. I have a question now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here, I'm writing in space because what you're saying is so important. And I wanted to mention the externality word. I didn't take an economy course until, economics course until after I had finished the biology program. And I said, well, what's an externality? Water, air, peace, quiet, space. Those considered not part of the economy. That was like an externality. I was shocked because those things were not given a value. And that's still the problem. Yeah, no, I think in the same sense that um, if we're measuring our success as even like a country by GDP and our success as an economy by GDP, like the description of wetlands is a success if we're going to build a mall or we're going to build something that's going to make us money, even though we're losing this uh, natural defense and we're losing this natural source of uh, balance, uh, it's still good for our economy and so it's seen as popular, and uh, that's a hard thing to kind of change, uh, both like psychologically and uh, just in practice. So yeah, that's what we mean by externality. Uh, we might not, something outside of our economy uh, that we don't take into account. Resources become more and more scarce. Prices for things like water and fresh food are going to rise rapidly. And yeah. Uh, so, what we've been doing about it as youths, um, since we're in the capital, we've been holding rallies around the state and the state house and press conferences outside of the state house uh, getting in contact with state legislators for climate legislation reasons and making small changes around our school um, we we held a clothing swap which people brought in clothes and then others took them for free so you wouldn't you know, lessen your clo clothing waste. And local food production on campus, like we have a garden that we grow all, all of our vegetables. Um, we compost and recycle. And we lobby on the school board for a net zero policy, which is um, being pushed right now. Um, some ways we can go about it together to help. So one thing you can do is you can vote in representatives that have pro-climate agendas. Um, holding those representatives accountable is also vital. You can send them letters, you can email them, just letting them know that you still care and you want to press them on what you want passed as bills. Um, you can divest savings from fossil fuel companies and invest in sustainable companies and renewable energy sources like Suncommon, Deep or a couple places. Um, you can also 
simply just educate yourself and peers, doing like simple research and talking about it with your friends and families are a bunch of ways you can definitely help us. I mean, we've been able to maintain our composting program at the school for a number of years, um, way longer than I've been there. Uh, we've, I, I think these small, I think we know that like the small sustainable acts aren't something that is going to individually like right this giant ship, uh, but it is like setting an example of how if we practice um, more sustainable ways of doing things then slowly things can get better. Um, so I don't know, I don't, I don't think there's a way to measure the like, exact amount of um, carbon that we've taken out of our atmosphere by like swapping clothes at school. Like, but it's, we still know that it does something and it's at least symbolically a good like, practice to do. So. Yeah. I think uh, maybe you mentioned this when you first started, but. How, how are your communication lines with other groups like you in other high schools? So um, there's a thing called the Vermont Youth Lobby that I've been involved with for the past few years. And that's, that essentially is that. Um, in, it's a larger organization that plans more broader legislative action uh, that we have, and where we have like members from schools around the state who have their own uh, school-wide initiatives. Uh, there's also something went through uh, VEEP, the Vermont Energy Education, something, <laughs> I don't know, um, that, uh, what? Program. Program. Uh, that is called the uh, Youth Climate Leaders Academy, and that also brings together school groups from around the state to come together and share ideas and collaborate. That's where a lot of these programs came from. Uh, we've done things like things like trying to plant like more trees around our school and small things like that all come from ideas, just like sharing with other people our age. Um, and I've, we've seen a lot of really great um, connections between them. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask about um, how is your um, net zero lobbying to the school board going? I'd like a report on that. And I'd also like you to comment about a program on NOVA that I saw where this methane gas is coming up out of the earth and it's something that has not much to do with whether anybody's doing anything or not. Do you know what I'm referring to up in the Arctic? Yeah, These no, big there's holes permafrost that are um, melting, but the permafrost melting and a lot of the other melting comes from a feedback loops started by warming temperatures in the first place. So by decreasing temperatures altogether and decreasing the amount of carbon in our atmosphere, we're decreasing the amount of melting, which in turn decreases the amount of methane in our atmosphere. But there's one over in the, so. in, in Russia that where they it just came up with a, a boom, like, a, like yeah. it was coming from Middle Earth, and, and it's increasing the methane ring around. And I just wondered if you have any comment on that. Yeah, I think methane is an issue, um, and it's a stronger greenhouse gas and its ability to trap heat in our atmosphere, there's still a large, significant, less amount of methane in our atmosphere already. And on the larger scale of amount of methane being released into our atmosphere versus the amount of carbon in our atmosphere, carbon is significantly the gas that is being pumped in more and the one that we can change. Uh, the Earth naturally produces these greenhouse gases and has systems to absorb them back into our soil. What we're doing by burning more carbon is offsetting this balance. So yeah, there are gonna be natural causes to the heating of our atmosphere, but we need to focus on things that we can't control. But yeah, that's definitely still a problem. I've been yeah. very impressed with the impact that youth had on the legislature, more than you may know. And your showing up there is wonderful. I wondered if you had any direct contact or direct knowledge of any bills that were now being introduced about replacing 
dirty sources of electricity with cleaner sources of electricity. Because I don't think we have much control over it right now. And we're going to have a lot more electric cars coming along soon. We're going to need more electricity. And I don't know if any of your legislative contacts are working on that particular issue of clean electric energy. And if not, can you give them a push? So yeah. on the state level, um, Thankfully, Vermont does get a lot of its electricity from renewable sources. It is controversial. A lot of our electricity comes from Hydro-Quebec, which has its own um, problems. And I do believe that there are things called, that there are bills that put money into expanding solar programs. Um, but that's definitely something that we need to continue to do. Uh, thankfully, Vermont doesn't, I don't think, get a huge amount of our electricity from the burning of fossil fuels, which is good. Um, but hydro, it's still um, environmentally controversial, the use of hydro. But um, that's definitely a, a, something that we'll continue to push for. And I'll have to check. Yeah, and so there is um, something called the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act that was passed that essentially holds businesses in Vermont accountable to reduce their individual emissions and the state's emissions by a certain amount by, I believe, 2050. And if we don't reach the goal, that goal, uh, we can actually sue the government, from what I understand, or that there are going to be actual repercussions to not meeting specific goals. And a lot of those goals are around the amount of uh, fuel or amount of energy we take through non-renewable sources. So altogether, it, there's a large incentive around the state to switch to renewable um, and I believe the other big thing around that is uh, just reducing our energy use in general. Vermont doesn't have a big production sector, but we do use a lot of energy in heating and transportation. So a big look is how to reduce as much transportation as possible altogether, so we don't even have to think about where we're getting the fuel, and reducing the amount of uh, electricity we use on heat already, because a lot of homes aren't weatherized. So. There's other solutions that are um, more immediate and I would I believe easier um, patches on our system, at least in the state. Yeah. Um, I think I think what you're doing and what Vermont is doing is great. But do you have any idea what's going on in the rest of the state? Are there other youth groups doing what you're doing for similar way? Yeah, like I said, um, the, so the youth lobby does have uh, members from Southern Vermont and Trinity County and all around. And even if members that are not super active, we do have a listserv, an email list, and connection to schools from virtually every part of the state. Um, and also, like I said, the Youth Climate Leaders Academy, run by Veep, is also um, inclusive of schools from all around the state, not just Central Vermont. Um, and sharing these ideas and mobilizing. Um, and whenever we have rallies, I know at least a few uh, students from places like Brattleboro coming all the way up, uh, Virginia, like all around the state. Um, so we do definitely have this reach, and we're still working on growing that more. Um, what about the rest of the country, though? Around the country. <laughs> <laughs> you can take care of that. Have you yeah, I mean, there's larger like sectors of national organizations that we've worked with before. Um, but that's, I think, a larger um, issue. And it's harder, especially as students, to kind of tackle nationwide um, problems. There are different conventions of youth, like national conventions that we've talked about before uh, going to, which is like between ourselves. But um, yeah, it's, I think, the most effective organizing, especially here, is especially through student organizing, is statewide and local. I think that's where we have the most impact, and that's where our voice is heard the most. Um, especially in a small state like Vermont, it's hard to kind of get footing on a national level, so. Any of you guys can answer that? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, in terms of rallies and talking to the legislators, do you feel as though they're listening to you, and do you feel as though it's, it's advancing the cause, that they, that they are really trying to do something? 
I think it honestly depends on the legislator, but um, I don't think it can ever hurt to like contact your legislator because you know something is better than nothing. Um, but yeah. There also have been um, laws, like I talked, said, mentioned the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed two years ago, um, and that was after a lot, a huge surge in, surge in youth activism. Um, not related to climate change, but similarly, uh, there was a huge swath of gun control bills passed because of youth activism. Um, so especially in a state like Vermont, uh, direct relationships to your legislators and the people in power make a pretty big impact. Um, just because I do believe that there are bills that are now law that would not be so without um, them just seeing that young people care or want it to happen. So. My question has to do with the rest of your high school. Um, I'm wondering if, I mean obviously not everybody is an activist, but do you think that most of your fellow students agree with you in terms of how important it is to tackle the climate crisis, or do you think that there's a lot of passivity? Um, I would say yes. I think everyone is concerned about it, and I would guess that everyone is mostly educated, even if they're not like speaking up as much as Earth Group is or Youth Lobby. Um, even just by like little things like composting their lunch and recycling things, they are doing their part, even if they aren't speaking out as much about it. But I think everyone around our age pretty much has the same fear of this like existential crisis that they can't really control. And I think, I would say they're really scared. Yeah. I was going to say good, but it isn't what I mean. <laughs> good that they're aware yeah. of what best we make the world for. Yeah, and like they're, uh, we kind of said in the presentation, like I think we've all grown up with seeing these like numbers of like, you know, the, the year 2030 to us is not, we're getting to still be pretty young. Like, that's a pretty kind of strike that's coming up, and that's the reality that most of our adult life will have to live under if we don't do anything. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, Andrew Shapiro, I work with the Vermont Energy Education Program. And um, in, in answer to the question about legislation, the Senate just passed the, or was the House just passed the Clean Heat Standard, which is really an important bill to get homes and businesses off of fossil fuels and onto electrified solutions. And so that's in process right now, so that's something you can support. We're also asking the Senate to put up some money so that we can get to every school in the state um, with our programs to work with kids around climate change and, and the climate change action plans that are happening. So that's something else you could support. I'm, I'm curious that, uh, I have, are we just interrupting and you have like uh, you know 12 more slides and that we should be hearing more? No, no, we have one more that's just discussion questions we were planning on if we had time breaking up into smaller discussion groups and having uh, more dialogue. Um, so if there are no further questions, we can move on to that, but we're happy to take more questions. Um, so I have a question. <laughs> I just didn't want to keep interrupting if you had to finish. Um, I, um, I, I'm curious about the Vermont Energy Education Program. One of them talks about uh, climate trauma as a as a sort of a um, a new kind of uh, overarching trauma over the whole earth, you know, for all humanity. And it's a pretty interesting article, and it kind of stands things on its head in terms of you know what what the experience is. The other one, the other article, just talks about dis dissociative experience that we all know this, we're in trouble and then we're all going to go get in our gasoline-powered cars and go home, and we're going to put the clothes in the dryer, and we're going to you know, fly to Mexico for vacation, and we're going to do all these things. And so, that, so this particular article just talks about how um, 
this dissociation, uh, that the remedy for it is something that was actually happening a lot like 20, 30 years ago, or you know, 40 years ago even, um, which is to start reconnecting people and their lifestyles with the environment, you know, really like connecting those dots very directly all the time so that people are just, you know, actually doing stuff instead of sort of, because that must be some of the distress that you guys see is there's like, you know, the lip service that we pay to, you know, wringing our hands, and then we're all just, we haven't changed anything, right? Or not much. I mean, it's this, the change is too slow. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that was a question. <laughs> no, but I think I agree. I think we all, yeah. I think, I think that a lot of that is true. A lot of people say things and don't really act on it but I think a lot of it is a personal decision. Like me personally, I don't use the dryer. I hang dry all my clothes. I have an electric car. I'm vegetarian, so my carbon footprint is very, very, very low. So a lot of it is a lot of personal decisions on how we ourselves could do better. That's right. Yeah, yeah and it's just what this talks about is the, is the actual psychology of dissociation. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, is there any effort to change the curriculum of the high school to have a greater emphasis on climate change? Um, well, we actually, we already have, I think, like, two or three classes focusing on climate change. Um, and we have a pretty big curriculum around it already. Um, yeah, we have a class on, I think, Yeah, there's a, a class called the Climate Crisis and a class called Environmental Applications. Um, and they both kind of like focus on the climate crisis. Yeah. Does the Climate Council, or what Climate Council, have youth representatives on it? Yeah. That's kind of interesting answer. But yeah, there is, um, uh, and we're a youth lobby, a member of youth lobby is on the council. and. I think that shows how kind of close the state is um, in that, like, in how, and also how close the network of students who care about um, this stuff is, uh, that, yeah, yeah, kind of direct involvement in some of the solutions being made, which I think is a really great step forward. One follow-up, uh, you might have an answer, is it only in high school they have to change this curriculum, or are they doing this also in elementary and middle uh, school? I, I couldn't say um, statewide, but I would say that um, this picture is from um, the Vermont Youth Climate Congress uh, that we held a few years ago, and in that we wrote a declaration um, expressing what exactly we want to see from our legislators in the coming years, um, and a big part of that was agreed upon by young people that we need, um, I don't believe that there's any bill right now that mandates uh, climate education in our schools, but that was definitely a shared concern around, um, you know, while Montpelier is very progressive and has these classes, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, schools around the state that don't, so that's definitely something that needs to, needs to change a lot of people care about. Where I promised you the last one. Yeah. Uh, what's your next action? Um, right now we're planning the Rally for the Planet on April 29th, uh, which will have young people from around the state come together. We've been held, holding it every year except for the past two years because of COVID. Um, and it's more of an event to kind of, at the end of the legislative session, we kind of recap what has happened, uh, what we'd like to see in the next legislative session, um, and then more just community network building um, and strengthening that kind of connection between schools um, and between young people who care, um, as well as inspiring and educating people uh, an important part of this coming action is also a green jobs fair where we're hopefully going to expose a lot of young people to um, specific opportunities that they can get involved in, um, either as a career in sustainable work around like installing solar and things like that, or as like summer internships. Uh, so 
Is there exciting new things that are coming up in the next month or so? So I feel um, inspired by what you're doing, and I also feel like um, you're presenting it as your problem. And I think the question for us, since we help create the problem, is what you're saying we need bold action. So are we willing to really support bold action by our legislators, and are we willing to um, take bold action ourselves, even if inconvenient? So inconvenient. So I, you know. I have a response for you, Michelle. Yes. <laughs> There's a group called Third Act that Bill McKibben started. And it's to engage the elders of our country in climate change work. And you can Google Third Act. They've got a they've got three uh, corporate banks that they're trying to ban right now from fossil fuel investment. They want people to sign a pledge saying that if these banks, by the end of the year, don't divest, that all of us that have accounts in them will close them. There are another, other steps, too. So if you go to Third Act, it's specifically for people 60 and older to tap and get involved in climate change work. Thank you. What, if, what do you all talk about now in terms of population? Um, I just took a class at the month at high school that is one of the classes that Ben um, mentioned. Um, it's actually, I realize the, the full name is um, Environmental Applications, uh, Human Population and Consumption, and it looks more at the scientific effect of, uh, our, are you talking about like the growing population in the state or in the, in the world? World, I mean, yeah. or you know, as, a pro, as part of the problem or not. I mean, I think it personally is tricky for me to say and to point to growing population as a problem because I think that gets into ideas around who, like how much, how many children should, I don't know. I think controlling populations can get tricky uh, when we're talking about how to do so. Uh, and I don't think population control is the answer because we do produce enough food to feed everyone. Um, and we do have a lot of land and there are countries in like Italy whose populations are decreasing or countries around Europe and in the West where populations are not growing that fast. So when you took a broader scope at the problem, it's not that necessarily there are too many people being born or their population is growing too much. It's just we have a system that is not sustainable in protecting and feeding everyone. So I would, that's kind of my specific take. I don't know if anyone else. Do you want some help setting up the discussion groups, or do you want to continue with this open discussion? I think um, whatever works best. I don't know. We've got a good dialogue. Yeah. Would you rather? I, yeah, maybe because there's not a full room. We could just we could like address them. Yeah, we can just just address the questions. Yeah. Oh, so we we do have these discussion prompts that we can get no, into, no, okay. uh, or you can bring up something else. But yeah. it's good to have this dialogue and definitely open up more to um, hearing what you all have to say about this um, and anything you're interested in. But yeah, these are things to get you thinking. In answer to that first question, which I love, um, I just want to note there's a name I can't remember, a philosopher who said that a man's, man, man's moral neighborhood is as far as he can ride a horse in a day. So it's very hard for us morally to feel this obligation to be as humans. Maybe great maybe grandparents can do it more better. I think if we're also look, thinking about like philosophies and ways of thinking of things, there are cultures around the world that have those ideas of um, the importance of thinking of seven generations ahead of you. I know it's been a big tenant of um, the modern environmental movement, um, I think, is a good um, I don't know, philosophy to keep in mind. I think of like mindsets to work under. Yeah, and the, they were. Okay. Go back to the country and then the world. Um, I get so upset when I see all these ads for like cruises and flying here, flying there, and building these new places and, and islands and maybe in the, in the middle of the country to make everything so beautiful for everybody to spend, 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 and use more fuel. And um, I don't know 
that's a question or not. It's just something that's always on my mind that we can do things here. You're doing great here in Central Vermont, and Vermont is doing great, but I don't know about the other states and how many people. That's why I asked if there are other groups, not that you're associated with, but are there other groups that you're aware of who are, who are being active in at least this country? Um, I personally only know of one, but my aunt um, just started her entire daughter's school system with a composting like company, I guess. Like every single school in this town called Scarsdale in New York in Westchester. Um, her name is Michelle Sterling. She just started composting in the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school, which has like thousands of kids in it. So she's just started that whole thing with her and a couple other coworkers, which is just one thing that I know of, which is just a minor impact, but I think it shows like some little things that we could do. And I would say internationally and nationally, um, there are organizations like Extinction Rebellion, and um, I know of, I think it's called Just Stop Oil, um, that recently did a demonstration where they um, went out on an English soccer field and strapped themselves to the goalpost and tried to get people. So there are there are global um, networks of people getting involved. Um, and those are just a few organizations at the top of my head. Uh, I've on I've been focusing. All of us have been focusing on the local level, but there are national organizations and lobbying firms um, set up to defend the climate. Uh, uh, maybe not enough, but <laughs> there are some. In the back. Uh, yeah, there's a question about ed ed education at lower grade levels. Um, our Vermont Energy Education Program offers programs K through 12 on energy and climate change. And of course, you can't confront a second grader with climate change and all the worry associated, but you can build the skills that they need to begin to understand this issue well when they get old enough to be able to deal with it. So, you know, that's available to all schools in the state, and regardless of the ability to pay. That's something you can do is get this education into your local school. You know, the Montpelier School, particularly the high school here, has just been doing fabulously well. Um, and um, you know, people say we're doing really well in Vermont. I just uh, talk about something else, but our transportation energy is higher than just about any other state yeah. in Canada. Um, so we do well in many ways, like these kids are doing, but we've got a long way to go. So yeah, I would invite anyone to um, just look over some of the uh, discussion prompts we already uh, set up, if you have any response to them, um, and we'll still definitely take feedback. I'm talking too much, but I, um, the David Suzuki Foundation has uh, a lot of information about climate change and support and actions and 10 top tips. But they also challenge us to have three conversations with others, our peers, about climate change. And these are great questions. But they also have also a program to teach us how to do it at the Thanksgiving table without losing our families. <laughs> so what is the name of the organization? The David Suzuki okay. Foundation. So they have this little thing that helps us be less divisive when we're asking questions. But these would be great questions to ask our neighbors, right? Also, if any of you guys have responses to these, do you have any responses to any of these questions? Uh, just to go back to what you were saying um, about talking to people, uh, I think it's really important that you, uh, you know, instead of saying no, but when you're talking to somebody who might have a different uh, opinion to you on this subject, you kind of say yes, and if you look at it, you know, this way, um, maybe maybe there's another path you can take with this or you know, um, with this, um, and I think that's really important to keep in the back of your head. Um, when you're talking to somebody who might, you know, have a difference of opinion on the changing climate and global warming. Uh, yeah, and if, uh, 
we want to dive into the discussion prompts. Um, if anyone doesn't have any further questions. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I just have one thing. Uh, sure. I've been thinking about with the last couple of years of COVID, mm -hmm. how we're not traveling as much, and there's a lot of Zoom. And the Zoom still stays, you know, like they're not there together with some people. But it is a way in which I think a lot of people have started to think about what their office space and what their work can look like and where they can be and how they can be together with others. So I would say that in terms of what's happened with COVID, to take that and think about that with climate change, but to also think about the ways in which we can then be closer together with those of us more in our neighborhoods. And I know that we have, uh, where we are, a neighborhood dinner that used to be once a month we go to all these different houses and everybody in the neighborhood uh, and other communities have done it too. And now with COVID, it's around the fire. It's a happy hour you know, where we check in around the fire about how everybody's doing. So that's a chance where we talk about, okay, what are your needs? How are you doing? Do you need help with this and do that? And we begin to build from a very basic level that sense of community once again that I think has really been destroyed by our very individualistic, consumer-oriented society. So I would say taking what's happened to us now within the last couple of years, we've been looking at it with that perspective of global and then the way in which we can begin to develop again our community. Yeah, for sure. That's a really, really good talking point. And I can't speak for everybody, but I think that in the past couple of years with COVID, with a lot of things shutting down and coming to a close, um, like uh, like you're mentioning with Zoom um, and that uh, booming, um, I think we've seen that we can, you know, take steps towards uh, renewable and energy efficient things, uh, and they might not be labeled as oh, this is energy efficient, uh, like Zoom. Um, but they help in the long run, um, like not commuting 45 minutes to a job um, and instead having a Zoom meeting, like you mentioned. So I think that's really important, and that's a great point. Yeah, and that, um, that reminds me of, I was just having um, a talk with our advisor, uh, Mr. Sabo, about, about the similar thing around, um, you know, the solutions kind of seem overwhelming. Uh, but he said a similar thing to what you said around COVID and that kind of parallel in that um, we were able to switch our patterns pretty quickly around to do that. We were also able to develop a vaccine in a rate that we never thought we could before because we actually put our time and energy and human thought into it. And we put so much into it that we were able to actually accomplish, um, accomplish it in a way that we never thought we could. Um, you know, nothing's impossible in that regard. Uh, we didn't think we could put a man on the moon. We could, you know, I don't know. I think it's good to, I, I think that that's a point of hope that I, I would like to just like echo from what you were saying. Uh, yeah, and to build on that, I think we've seen a lot of necessary steps that have been taken, like the, uh, like a lot of climate summits with world leaders and the Copenhagen Accord and the Paris Accord, um, but these are merely just you know, words on paper, and we actually have to see uh, a lot of the goals that are outlined in those reports um, actually being uh, met and uh, our local and global communities working towards those goals that are outlined on the reports. Uh, yeah, back. I have a comment on your second talking point there. Um, I think actually the money that we need to spend on electrifying buildings, putting in renewables, making buildings more efficient, those all return money immediately back to our local society in terms of labor for all the work that has to get done for this stuff. Keeps the money in state, so I don't think there really is a economic drag on the present. It's, the drag is to get the powers that be to invest the money in this that really has a very immediate return um, in terms of labor and, and the money being spent in the state, in addition to the long-term protection of, of everybody. Um, I, would, I would agree with that, um, and I think this point, that point is more both towards a lot of people that don't see it that way and see just um, the immediate shift 
I don't know, being too hard. Uh, I would also say that the economic uh, costs can also translate into the amount of oil reserves that oil companies already have that they're not gonna be able to sell even though they spent money, they're gonna lose money doing that. Um, they're gonna lose money having to have build the infrastructure to switch their companies away from oil, um, small things like that, or I guess big things. But um, I think I would agree that in the long run, it'll save us money and some things will directly um, come back to us. Uh, but I think the second point was just around that is Usually, when you bring up like, you know, we need to change the way that we do things, the media response, especially, um, yeah, politically, usually is uh, okay. But like, where do we have the money to make that transition? Um, so, I think it's just good to, to think about that. But I would agree. I think most people here agree that yeah, it's worth it in the end, and we'll save us money. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I think I said I'd like to do another one, but I don't mind. That's a little bit. Um, what do you think about the, the, the idea that we're going to move from a consumer society, values material goods, to a more spiritual society that doesn't create as many missions, and that we need a new sustainable age, we've got to get rid of industrialism you know, as a long term goal? Yeah, I mean, I can only, I don't know if anyone else has strong opinions on this. Um, I think we talked, we talked a lot about in my classes around, you know, when we outline, like, oh, when, to address the problem, we have to see how did we get here, and the answer is unequivocally through industrialization. Um, but I think it's a question of, uh, yeah, it's a nice goal to have, but it's just a hard um, route to take. Uh, it's a hard thing to get everyone on board with. But yeah. <laughs> anything else? But yeah, no, I think I think, you know, there were a lot of talks about that. And there's a lot of great ideas around like the how ideally um, we can end up in a way that we don't see a climate catastrophe. Um, what's hard is just balancing out how we can realistically get to those places in a time frame that meets like the demands of, of the crisis which is to say like a very small time. So um, it's always nice to have bills that are fully on that. So do you all have these conversations at your Thanksgiving table? <laughs> 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 so, so. <laughs> um, I definitely talk about this at home a bit. I didn't really do Thanksgiving this year, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, But yeah, I think it's very important to discuss this with your family. And I don't know, I think talking about it is the only way to make change. So, yeah. Yeah, you can impress the teenagers in your family by bringing this up. Be like, wow. Really interesting. Yeah, I think to just echo what everyone's saying, I think nothing can get done if you just ignore it. So. Having the hard conversations is good. Um, and especially because it sounds, I think, to a lot of people in this room like a no-brainer to make some of the changes that seem easy, yet we, some people in the state have, are still electing people that don't align with these, uh, these ideas. So, you know, that's a very real and direct way that you can change things, is just by electing people who make the laws that decide that we should continue on a path that's harmful. Um, the more you talk to people, the less likely they might be to elect people that go against these interests, so. Um, I've recently, uh, I mean, it, this isn't new, but come across some young people who are in their 20s, 30-year-olds, who have decided that they don't believe in voting anymore because it doesn't mean anything. And um, that's, uh, you guys had a knowing look there, <laughs> but uh, it's it's a real problem because in a way it's the only thing that we can do. You know, it's like it's just a small lever, but it's it could be a powerful lever. And I just wonder what you guys 
know about, I know that you're not, some of you aren't 18 yet, but you're looking right into it and how you feel about that. Yeah, um, I'm 18 and I did vote, um, and I do encourage people to vote, but I also definitely resonate with some of the, um, kind of how tired some people are, or yeah. the distrust of the system, yeah. and I get it, um, and especially as a young person to see kind of how poorly things have been run before, it does feel like it's easy to give up hope, and, you know, I, I, so I, I understand where they're coming from, but I do think that an important part of this change is electing. There are still people actively making laws that can make a difference on a larger level than what we can locally. Um, I think it's always good to support that uh, at all levels. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, how about, you know, Voting and revolution, maybe instead of voting, you know, revolution instead of voting. Or something. I don't know, but it just seems like I feel really old when I say to a young person, "No, you really should vote," <laughs> and then they give me this like it's so meaningless, you know. And and I just it makes me feel uh, kind of stuck or something, or you know that that um, because we do. You know, I, I mean, we couldn't be in a worse place right now in our democracy, but uh, we still we still have some grip on it. You know, so let's let's use it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that voting is really important, but you might have heard the phrase like, "Your dollar is your vote." Um, whenever you buy something in the store, oh, yeah. you're essentially like, like if you go buy gas for your car, you are voting for climate change essentially. Like it or not, but yeah. Good point. Or you're voting for climate crisis. Yeah. Right. Okay. Are you running for office? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I've thought about it. I think I'd make a good man. You are a So you have a, a, a room full of grandparents. Do you have any questions for us? Like, how did we get? Or what were you thinking? Or they're being very polite. Uh, well, one, que one, one question that I've asked my grandparents, uh, in particular, um, I know it's been touched on earlier uh, in the presentation, is education, and I was curious. I've heard his perspective um, and his knowledge, but I was curious if you all had any classes or programs in high school and maybe even college that related to environmental studies or climate change studies. No? Okay. Yeah, um, environmental studies, yes. I was in college over 50 years ago. No, there wasn't very much. Pollution, yes, because the new EPA market is nothing in that much at all. I think in the 60s, there was the Earth Days and so forth, where there was a lot of enthusiasm. Um, that was when I was already probably old then, but uh, um, I remember the Cuyahoga River used to burn up the flame. And, and the Earth is, we let Earth heal itself to some extent. Um, that, there was some enthusiasm there, and I think there were some result, results. But perhaps not enough. We also, in the 60s, just urban renewal, remember that? We right. just bulldozed the neighborhoods and put in highways and, and walls mm -hmm. and washed neighborhoods, cultures. Oh, I mean, kind of relating to that, I was, I, one question that made me think um, what Noah was talking was uh, like, what do you, do you think that other people in your generation and your friends or people you know uh, around your age have, the sim have similar feelings uh, to us after hearing us speak? Uh, or what do you think that disconnect is and why, um, if that makes sense? Good question. <laughs> yeah. <it's laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, I grew up in the uh, 60s and 70s. I mean, that's when I was in college, and so there was a 
lot, a lot of discussion and a lot of demonstrations. And I was in Berkeley and a lot of People's Park and people wanting to do the very same things that we're wanting, you know, we're all wanting to do, to have community, to have peace, to have. And so I grew up and was around all these people who felt very much the same way that we're feeling now. And then what begins to happen is that big businesses and you know, individualism and consumerism, it all starts to take over. And we find that we're fighting the same stupid stuff again, you know, of, of being once again in this situation. I mean, what happened to the, you know, the 60s and 70s and all our hope that, you know. So anyway, I do find that a lot of people my age very much feel the same. So, so follow up on what Carolyn just said. Um, I tend to hang out with like-minded people, um, and that's Vermont. And I have friends all around the country, around the world, um, who are deniers. You know, they grew up in the Northeast Kingdom, and we just listen to some of those people, and they say, oh, there's no problem here. Um, or I can just go up the road for me, and there's a woman who said, there's, there's none of this. There's none of this. Just get off it, Alice. So I can turn off my lights, and I can not use a different dryer, and I can do all these things. And I feel like, okay, I'm doing something, but the rest of the world, if I keep coming back to that, the rest of the country, it's, it's bigger. It's all those cruises, it's all those people who are saying, oh, we're not affecting it, or I don't want to deal with it because I want to go on those things. Mm -hmm. I want to make a lot of money. So that's my target. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to, first of all, I want to, or you know, I, I, yes. first of all, I want to say I appreciate how you suggested we respond to one another. And nothing is better than asking a question instead of saying no. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the things, I think maybe I disagree with Allison a little bit. We can all agree politically, in a sense, in this room, I'm thinking that's more to the left than to the right. It does not directly affect how you how you act around climate change. There's, and any, uh, uh, it's like uh, I live with a person. I'll call her my wife. She, <laughs> she's extraordinarily on your side, vehemently so. And she was forced to make up a rule, like, okay, you can visit one grandchild a year in an interview. You know, most people, even though they're going to vote how we vote, that psychological connection or disconnection between your behavior and what you know up here is really an important issue to, to learn about more. How do we reach people at an emotional level so they really feel okay about not doing something?
questions or comments or do you want do you want the last word? <laughs> Uh, thank you for listening. Have a nice day. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having us.